Now, in his book, Deep Change, Robert Quinn talks about three different ways that we do get involved in activity where we do um, perhaps minister or perhaps work, things that we do in our work assignments, the uh, way we operate at home. Three different paradigms, if you will, of what he calls leadership. Maybe I'll just show you. I think they're here on the next slide. And we're going to talk about these for just a minute. Then we're going to find them as Paul talks about them in Romans chapter 12. The first one that he talks about is the individual contributor. This is a way of going about doing things, getting tasks done. Now, an individual contributor is a person who is motivated by doing a particular task to the best of his or her ability. As it says, the individual contributor is pretty much focused on what they have to do themselves. Give me a job, I'll do it. Now, the upside of being an individual contributor or of thinking that way is that these are the people that get things done. You know, there are certain people in your world, if you want a task done, give it to them. I remember when Ken Grenier was helping us build the, the church here, he knew I was not the individual contributor because he would say the worst thing you can do is have the pastor show up at the job site because he'll talk to everybody and then nobody gets anything done. So you want to build a building, you want somebody who's going to go at it and get that wall built or get that floor down or get that window put in. The downside of being an individual contributor uh, is that there's a temptation to not see the bigger picture, to only see the task that we have to do as the one thing that has to happen and everything else just kind of fades into the background. The reality is that when it comes to bringing God's presence and God's love and God's goodness and healing into our world, the job is too big for any of us. Even Jesus himself made it very clear that he alone would not fulfill that job. He looked at his disciples, guys with all the flaws and all the warts and wrinkles that we have, and then some. And he said to them, you're going to go out and do greater things than I did. You're going to be an extension of me in this world. So the individual contributor is a person who sees a task and will do it, but needs to remember that the task is bigger than ourselves. Did you ever have that attitude of, I can do a better job myself than if I give this to anybody else. That can be the beginning of the idea of being an individual contributor. Uh, if you're the kind of person maybe who finds it hard to recruit other people or hard to let anybody else into your project, you're probably more into that individual contributor mindset. Very, very valuable, absolutely essential to get things done. But we want to go beyond that in our thinking. And that brings us to the manager. The second level of leadership that Quinn talks about is what he calls the manager. A manager is a person who has come to see that relationships are more important than simply getting tasks finished. Uh, I had this brought home to me as I was thinking back, my very first job. By the way, your first job, you're probably an individual contributor. That's usually where we all start. And my first job was to work for an older man named Mr. Spellman over uh, along the shores of Lake George and Silver Bay. Now, Mr. Spellman he was retired at this point, and he basically filled his time by doing odd jobs for all of the cottagers up and down that portion of the lake. Uh, you understand, at Lake George, they are cottages, they're not camps. So you get to charge more if you're working on somebody's cottage than if you're working on their camp. And my very first job, my folks went and found for me, was to work for Mr. Spellman. I showed up the first day, and he handed me a shovel. And I dug a water line out. It was four feet down. The hole must have been about this by this. It was the 4th of July, no less, but these people needed their water. And I sat there and dug. And all summer long, I did those kinds of jobs for Mr. Spellman for the amazing salary of a dollar an hour, if you can imagine. That's called being an individual contributor. Now, why wasn't Mr. Spellman digging holes? Now, he had discovered the power of bringing people together, of building relationships. <laughs> he got this kid who could dig. He had people who needed holes dug in their yards and other things fixed. He knew tradespeople. Obviously, he'd been around a long time. He knew people up and down that part of, of the country. If he needed a plumber, he could find one. If he needed an electrician, he could find one. If he needed more carpentry skills, he could put a roof on something. He could get people there. 
And while he did some of the work, mostly he pointed out to me what I was supposed to do, and um, he managed the whole project. Now, what was going on there? Well, he had found that he could get a whole lot more done by maintaining a bunch of relationships, by keeping people connected with each other, than simply by going out there at whatever age he was then, must have been in his 60s or maybe early 70s, and trying to do it all by himself. That's the power of being a manager. And we'll come back to that because that's a powerful concept in the way God puts us together. But the third category, and the most important one, is what Quinn calls the true leader. Now, by talking about leaders, he is not talking about people who have titles, such as pastor or boss or CEO or whatever, uh, man, whatever the person is called, perhaps the place where you work. In fact, he points out that very often, the people at the top of an organization are the least likely to be true leaders in the sense that he defines. Sounds kind of crazy. Uh, they may be good managers. Uh, they may have no problem telling people what to do. But when Quinn talks about being a leader, he's talking about a person who is motivated not by self-interest, self, uh, not by survival, not by money, not by having a, a lot of acclaim or have a lot of recognition, but is motivated by getting something special done, has a deep vision for something that has to happen at any cost. So he says, basically, your true leader will lay it all down for the thing that is of value. Uh, let me give you an example. Let's suppose you come home after work. Dad, you're exhausted. You're physically and mentally tired. All you want to do is sit down after supper and relax with a book, perhaps turn on the television or go online, do something that doesn't require a lot of thought. You deserve it. The dishes are done. You even helped clear the table. The food's put away. It's time to unwind. And then your fifth grader comes in. <laughs> You've never seen that look before, have you? She has her math book in one hand. She has a handout from her teacher in the other. Her face says it all. I just can't do it. Little tears of frustration are beginning to well up in her eyes. Can't do what, you ask, as if you couldn't tell. This stupid homework, it's too hard. I just don't get it. I have to do these problems. I have a quiz tomorrow morning. I know I'm going to fail. So, Dad, what are you going to do with your evening? What evening? What kind of person do you want to be? What kind of dad are you going to be? Or, as Robert Quinn would say, what kind of leader are you going to be? Are you going to say, well, you know, this, that's your problem. I have my job over here, and I worked all day, and I did a good job, and I deserve a rest, so too bad for you. That'd be the individual contributor doing their thing. Are you going to say, well, you know, we might be able to put together a good team for you, and somehow, someday, we'll figure this all out. That might be the manager, but you're still going to get your evening. Or are you going to lay it all down? Well, you know what you're going to do. You put down the remote, you close your book, you smile, you get up to help her with her homework. You're a leader. No, you're not a teacher. You may be almost as confused by some parts of her homework as she is. But you're not going to let your little girl crash and burn. Why not? Because it's not about you. It's about you doing whatever it takes to help her succeed. Period. What does it cost you? You don't even calculate that because that's not what it's about. And when this scene replays itself tomorrow night, what are you going to do? Who are you going to be? Now, that's a choice that we make. I've created one little scenario, but we make it in many, many areas of life. You know how it is when you come up to something that needs to be done, and you say, I'm going to do this not because of what's in it for me, not because I'm going to get X number of dollars per hour, not because somebody will say, oh, isn't he, isn't she a nice person? I'm going to do this whether anybody knows or not. I'm going to do this whether somebody else gets the credit or not. I'm going to do this because it's the right thing to do. It's the most important thing to do. And even if I come out on the wrong end of the stick because I do this, it's worth it. Jesus put it this way. This way. He said, he who saves his life, looking out for himself, making everything about himself, is going to lose it. 
but he who loses his life for my sake and the sake of the good news will find it. That's the definition of a true leader. And that's what God is looking for when he looks at you and me. People who, like Jesus, will see what needs to be done and will have such a deep commitment to God and to his love and to his presence, knowing he's going to make it all work out all right, that we'll do what we need to do. Now, in his letter to the, Rome, to the Romans, Paul touches on these three different ways of functioning when we do things for God. And they're all important. Getting tasks done is essential. Now, when you go back and talk to people back there, there are going to be some task-oriented positions and things that need to get done. Uh, the video doesn't happen unless somebody climbs up the tower, right? And makes it happen. It doesn't get rendered. It doesn't get put up online unless somebody takes the time to do that. You're going to see people talking about relationships and teams where you work with other people and get way more done than you would by yourself. But at the core, Paul's going to bring us back to what makes us do this. What's the deep passion that causes us to do what we do for God? And the first thing I want you to see that Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, he says these words, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Now, the great temptation when we're in individual contributor mode, whoever we may be and whatever we're doing, is that we think that our task is the most important thing in the whole world. Now, you've probably worked with people like that who were so busy doing their thing that you couldn't peel them away to do something that was even more important upon which the success of everything depended. We come to see ourselves in this mode as being indispensable. Well, they couldn't, they couldn't run this place without me. Now, that may be true, but that's really dangerous, isn't it? And do you want to be part of anything that depends on any one person, even if that person is yourself? And Paul says, look, step back. Take a, a look at who you are. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Paul says, let's not measure ourselves by what we can do or by our own importance, but rather in terms of trusting God to accomplish something we could never do. God's calling us to do things that are impossible. He's calling us to do things we can't make happen. None of us can change people. We can't even change ourselves. None of us can change our community. But God can. And he said, are you willing to do that, would you trust me to use you? So Paul says, don't look at yourself and evaluate yourself. Rather, see yourself in terms of what God wants to do through you. Paul goes on to talk about how we have relationships which take us far beyond anything we could do by ourselves. That kind of gets to the manager idea. Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. You know, the manager, as Quinn would describe him, is someone who understands the power of bringing people together, like my boss, Mr. Spellman, who didn't dig holes. He just sort of watched and jumped in when he had to and then got out of it and kept the client happy while I was digging up their yard. The manager understands how to blend people with their gifts and talents so they can go way beyond anything they could do on their own. Think about, for example, the, the baseball manager who sits in the dugout during a baseball game. Uh, all I've ever seen these guys do is either chew bubblegum tobacco or sunflower seeds. And every once in a while, they'll make some funny gestures that nobody's supposed to figure out except the guy on the field. They never swing a bat, never catch a ball, never throw a pitch, never score a run. All they do is wear a uniform and go out and take the pitcher off the mound when he's messing up. That's all you ever see of a manager. That or else they go out and yell at the umpire and get kicked out once in a while just to keep the team psyched up. But where would the team be without the manager? His job is to take a whole bunch of individual contributors, most of whom are paid way more money than he is, and get them together to play as a team. Those guys can hit the ball farther than he can. They can pitch 
Uh, they can throw a fastball faster than he ever dreamed of. They can play the game way beyond anything he ever did or ever will do. But that's not what his job is. His job is to pull them together, to make them a team. Now, Paul says that we need to see ourselves as something bigger than our individual selves. And even though we may not be in charge of an area of ministry, you may not be the technical manager of something, the way we use the word in business or at work. Nonetheless, we can build those relationships. We can foster that sense of community. We can buy in with each other. We can be willing to be part of something bigger than ourselves. Uh, Jesus, or Paul describes it as being uh, like, the, like the parts of your body that have different functions. And in 1 Corinthians, he sort of explores that and, and basically says, you know, the eye doesn't have any right to say to the ear, we don't need you because you don't see as well as I do. Because the ear can say right back, well, we don't need you because you can't hear as well as I do. And if every one of us come into a task as individuals doing our own thing, we're basically going to end up competing with each other, showing each other up, well, you know, I can do this part better than you can. No, 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 I can do this part better than you can. Nothing gets done. Everybody's going off in different directions. So we can all grow and do so much more for God when we look at each other and go, wow, as good as I am at doing this little project here, how much more effective it will be because my friend here who doesn't think like me at all has a whole different set of gifts brings that together with mine and all of a sudden it's not that two plus two equals four but it goes way way beyond far beyond the sum of our individual gifts that's what the manager does with the baseball team figuring out who to have hit where and who to play where and doing all of that stuff so that all the gifts get maximized uh, my I have a uh, a grandson who's a pitcher, I have a grandson who's a catcher. Guess which one calls the shots? We watched, him, watched them play against their arch rivals this spring, and, uh, and my grandson won the game on the mound, the pitcher. But he was, throwing, he was playing catch with his brother, and his brother was calling the pitches. And time and time and time again, it just worked. They were in sync. It was like the great game of the entire year. The grandson behind the, the plate didn't get any credit for a strikeout, didn't get any credit for anything except catching the ball and signaling which pitch was next. You see, his ability to read the game and to sense what the batter was doing and just to know what should come next meant that the boy on the mound didn't have to try to make all that happen at one time. It was basically follow the leader. And in a sense, the leader was the kid who was behind the mask, sitting there, winning that game in many, many ways, but in ways that nobody would see except the guy on the mound. God's called us to be part of something bigger than ourselves. And Paul says, just think of yourself as part of the body. Uh, if you're called to be an arm, then don't try to be a leg. But don't think that you could do it all by yourself. Power of the manager. And then Paul says, but let's go one step further. Look with me at verses 6 through 8. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. Teaching, then teach. To encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. See, God has gifted each of us in a unique way, just like the parts of our body. But now he's saying, embrace that gift at the deepest level. Look at what he says. Prophesy to the maximum of your faith. If you're serving, or if you're teaching, or if you're encouraging, then make sure you do it. And double down on that thing where you're strong. I was listening to a church planting director, uh, a guy who runs a whole network of church plants across the Northeast. And he said to us, when we t bring in a candidate to plant a church, First of all, we, we evaluate them and assess them, and we give them a strength finders a survey or uh, inventory. And we find out what they're good at. And then we say to them, stick to that and go find people that can do the things you're not good at. Don't go spend the next five years of your life trying to be somebody you aren't. Stick to what you're good at. Think of David and Goliath. David was good at one thing, but he was really good at it. The slingshot. 
Saul put the armor on David, and David said, this is a joke. I can't do this. This isn't how I work. You stick with your armor, Saul. I'll stick with my slingshot. Now, it doesn't mean that we just run off with our gift and ignore everybody else. Oh, no. We surround ourselves, embed ourselves among people who have the skills that we don't have. Giving, do it generously. Leading, do it diligently. Mercy, do it cheerfully. What that says to me is do it from the heart. Take the thing God gave you to do and do it not for personal recognition, not because you're so good at it and nobody can do it as well as you can, not because you just want to impress your friends and sort of be part of a team. Those are all okay, but do it because you believe in what God has given you to do and it's worth leaving it all in the field. It's worth putting it all out there. Just like that dad who says, I'm going to get that homework done with my child. She's going to understand this one way or the other. We're going to figure this out. And I'm going to do it cheerfully and diligently. Give myself generously. So a week's gone by. You and your daughter got through the first math assignment and the big quiz. But every evening there's been another challenge. Now she faces the midterm exam. You wonder if she'll ever really make it in this class. So what do you do? Do you sit your daughter down and say, look, we've been working on this a long time, but it just doesn't seem to be your thing. You're never going to be a math whiz. Why don't you just take an F and move on? This class is going to be the death of both of us. It may feel like saying that, but are you going to say that to your fifth grader? You're never going to be good at this. Let's just stand down, and you can be a failure, and I'll be a failure too, but we're going to get some peace and quiet around here. Or do you reach out for help? Maybe you've carried this ball as far as you can carry it. Maybe you need to go meet with a teacher and devise a, a winning plan and say, you know, we're working hard on this. We're making a little progress, but we want to really get this thing down. Maybe you build a team by bringing in a tutor who really understands how to teach math. So that where you have the, the desire to see your child uh, uh, improve and succeed, this person knows how to get inside her head in ways that you don't. Maybe you become the chief coach and cheerleader, working together with a group of people who have a set of abilities that will all help your daughter or your son in some special way. Big question. Do you decide that failure is not an option? This is your kid, your daughter, your son, having a hard time, needing your help, needing other people's help. Do you look at that child and do you say, we will not fail? If that's what you do, if you say, we will not fail, then you're a leader, the way Robert Quinn describes You'll do whatever it takes. And that's just what your daughter or your son, and that's what our whole world needs. When you go back and talk to folks back there, just ordinary people like yourself and myself, uh, you're going to see people who believe in what they're doing, who are willing to not do some other things because God has put something in front of them that very, very much needs to be done. I live with one of those leaders my wife working with the nursery. And uh, I know all week long she carries the nursery. She and the other um, uh, weekly leaders, uh, Marissa and, um, and Marsha, for instance, they carry that around. Lisa Oldham has done this for years in their hearts. It's just a, it's just a part of them. And it's not just about ticking off a little box on the calendar. It's not just about doing this thing so my husband will be, will be happy or something like that. It's doing this because the kids matter. And be, it's a passion God put in her heart. Some of you are going to share that with her at some level or another. Uh, some of you are going to share getting involved with, with our tech department or getting involved with our, our music department or getting involved in a missions trip, getting involved with youth, getting involved with, um, with our, our, our children's programs, getting involved with mops, being a mopette worker or a leader. Uh, some of you are going to get involved with with our, um, our care ministry and uh, these other various ways that we interact with each other. I want to challenge you that as you do, be an individual bringing your special gifts. 
Be part of a team that says, wow, this is exciting because we're getting so much more done when we bring different gifts together. And most of all, let's leave it all on the field for the Lord. Whatever you do, do it with all your heart. Jesus reiterated that great commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. We could add to that, whatever we do for God, let's do with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength. Let's agree, failure is not an option when we're working for God. Let's bow our heads together. And Father, I thank you for a, a fantastic team of people here at Church of the Rock, serving in so many, many ways. Some of them seen every Sunday or every week, most of them not. People that are right now back with kids and that are back helping get things ready for our ministry fair. People who work, go to the hospital, people who, who uh, count the money and who uh, post the checks. and uh, People who work in many, many aspects. Conversations and phone calls and emails and cups of coffee uh, where someone's just looking out for someone else. Lord, I thank you for each and every one of them. I pray they would be blessed and affirmed today. And Father, would you give us that selfless attitude that we see in Jesus and be willing to go into a place where you've called us and just leave it all, give everything we have for that set time, work with passion, do the thing to the fullest of our ability for your glory. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.